Come on. Okay. Father in heaven, we do come to praise your name. We thank you and praise you that you do not give us what we deserve, that you are mindful of us, that you created us in your image, that you gave us a choice and we chose to disobey, to rebel against you, to sin, and we can't be in your presence because you are holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. But you didn't leave it there. You saw our stiff-necked rebellion. You saw what we could not do, but we needed to see that for ourselves so that we could see that the only way that we could be made right was by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And he lived a life as an example, and he said he would never forsake us, and instead he gave us his spirit so that we would never be alone, that we could carry out this ministry that he has started of reconciliation. May we be a light to this world. May our deeds be pleasing to you. May we offer up our lives as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto you. Let us hear your words today, O Lord, and fill us with your spirit to be doers of your word, not just hearers only. To realize that it's not about our will, but it's about your will. It's not about our ways, but it's about your way. And if we do live a life that, that brings glory and honor to you, then maybe, just maybe, we'll draw some others into the kingdom. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Walt, for being here when I was gone. And I'm nervous. I probably have little spots under here already. You still get nervous when you get up here, but I can't not proclaim the Word of God. I missed it while I wasn't here. I was talking... Well, you know, I'll tell you something about that that, that I missed there, too. And don't say you don't have time to, to read again. What's that? Well, that's exactly what I was going to say. As we were driving down the road each day, I'm thinking, how am I going to read the, the devotion and the, the scriptures this week and stay on top? And she read them to me. That was wonderful. Because as we've got back, we're not doing that. And I miss that. And it's so funny because we'd be wait till the kids got quiet in the car and everything, and then she'd start reading. As soon as we'd start reading, and she'd say, get behind me, Satan. And they'd just all like, <laughs> So I kept up. Don't say you can't keep up in everything. So I've entitled this, Be Holy as I Am Holy. And Merle read a scripture from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 19. I've got some scriptures today that I want you to read also, and we'll hand them out in a minute. I should have done it beforehand, but I didn't. What does it mean to be holy? Especially holy as God is holy. You should have read Leviticus chapters 13 to 24 this past week. You should have read Hebrews 10, verse 19 to the end of Hebrews, and you should have read Revelation chapter 1 and 2. Don't forget, it's in the bottom of the devotional there, whether you're doing the devotional or you're doing the reading. Yes, I'm going to keep preaching this way because I'm going to try to spur you to do that reading, to spend time in God's Word. I was talking to um, Brent this week, and Brent's, Brent's Brent. We'll just put it that way. Maybe he'll hear me say that. <laughs> But he said something that was so true. He said, the reason that I keep on preaching regardless is because he said, if I did not spend the time necessary to prepare a sermon each week, then I would not be walking in step with the Spirit like I should. He said, every single one of us should be reading our, and studying God's Word that much that we could present a sermon, whether you do or not. Now, if you want to some Sunday, let me know again. But we should be reading and studying God's Word enough that we're doing that so that we're saturating just like we exercise, just like we eat, anything else. Deuteronomy tells us to talk about it when we get up, when we go about, when we eat, when we lay down, all the time. And how much more do we have to proclaim since we know the name of Jesus? Walt talked about the church needing revival. You won't find the word revival in the Bible anywhere. What is revival? It's a reviving or a awakening. I took this definition to read it. Revival refers to a spiritual reawakening from a state of stagnation in the life of a believer. It encompasses the resurrection of love for God, for an appreciation of God's holiness, a passion for His Word and His church, a convicting awareness of personal and corporate sin, a spirit of humility, and a desire for repentance and growth in righteousness. Revival invigorates and sometimes deepens a believer's faith, opening his eyes to the truth in a fresh, new way. It generally involves the connotation of a fresh start with a clean slate, marking a new beginning of a life lived in obedience to God. 
And that was a good definition. That's why I chose that one. But I'm going to not disagree with Walt here, but I'm going to say something to expound upon it. Walt said we need revival. We don't need revival. Let me explain why. Because you got every bit of that when you were saturated with the Holy Spirit when you were sanctified on the day that you believed. Problem is, is we don't walk in step with the Spirit. We don't read God's Word enough. We seek our will instead of His will. So therefore, there is a huge need for revival in our lives and in the church. Make sense? Revelation 2, Jesus said these words after He'd gone to heaven. But I have this against you. You have abandoned your first love. Why did He have to say that? Why would we ever fall out of love? Why would we get to that point? Therefore, keep in mind how far you have fallen. Repent and perform the deeds you did at first. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, Or do you not know the wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanders, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. The problem is, is we don't feel like we're that person. Really? Do I not sin anymore? Have I realized total sanctification? And am I living and walking in step with the Spirit each and every step I make? No. Now you answer that for yourself. I can admit it. And it brings me to my knees. I pray to God. I ask Him to fill me more. I read His Word more. I seek His will more so that I will hear, Well done, my good and faithful servant, when I meet Jesus face to face. Verse 11 says, and that's what some of you were. See, you're not that way anymore. You are totally sanctified, totally set free, totally empowered by the resurrecting power that rose Jesus from the dead. The Spirit of God lives inside of you. And as you're reading Leviticus, I don't know about you, but I was excited. I'm ready to go read it again. You know, you can read it again in just two hours. Anybody want to take up the challenge with me? Read Leviticus again and all the skin diseases, everything else. But I see all that had to be done each and every day for them to have the presence of God dwell in the tent there. And you have the Spirit of God dwelling inside of you, O oh Christian. Do you realize that? Do you realize the power that you have? That if you pray believing, you can say to the mountain, jump into the sea and it will do so. That is what some of you were, but you were washed you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. You are a new creation in Christ. Just sometimes we need to grow up. Sometimes we need to have a revitalizing uh, to get us out of that stagnation. So have you been washed? Then you're clean. Have you been sanctified? Then you are holy and set apart. Have you been justified? Then you've been made but right with God. What can stand against you? Walt talked about our journey into holiness and a life changed. You're not on that journey if you don't see evidence of it in your life, if you're not doing good deeds that glorify God. But what does it mean to be holy? Well, then let's review a little bit. In Exodus 19, verse 6, it says, You will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. That's an adjective used there. Holy nation, describing who we are as a people. Later in verse 10 of Exodus 19, And the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them. It's a verb for holiness. Consecrate them today and tomorrow. Wash, have them wash their clothes and be ready by the third day, because on that day the Lord will come down on Mount, on Mount Sinai in the sight of the people. Put limits for the people around the mountain and tell them, Be careful that you do not approach the mountain or touch the foot of it. Whoever touches the mountain is to be put to death because unclean, unholy things cannot make contact, come in presence with God because of His holiness. But you have been washed, sanctified, and justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. In Genesis, we saw the beginnings. We saw sin. We saw separation, but we saw a promise of redemption. And we saw the birth of God's children. In Exodus, we saw God calling them out from the world to live differently, to worship Him in the wilderness. And He provided for all of their needs and all their cares in a land that could not provide for them. It surely meant death for them. We read about 
festivals and tabernacles and offerings and the priests and the glory of God and even Moses' face shone and the people were sore afraid. All the items that were used that were necessary in use of worship, all the cleanliness, all the festivals, and you can come into the throne room of God because of Jesus Christ, into the holy of holies because you are his child, a brother or sister of Jesus. Maybe you want to go back and read Leviticus again and read it in light of Hebrews and see what all that Jesus Christ has done and how much greater that he is than angels or than anything else and how much you should listen and obey the one who gave you life. Got a video that will explain Leviticus a little bit. Are you ready, guys? I didn't give you a forewarning. We'll listen to it, and I'll hand out these handouts, and I need some volunteers to read also. So I'm a, if you're volunteering to read, tell me that. I need, I think, nine or ten people. This video will give us a little bit of thought process as I talk more about Leviticus. Are you ready? How can we live in God's presence? Well, the answer is given to us in the book of Leviticus. For just before it, in the book of Exodus, we see Moses trying to enter God's presence. For God had just filled this newly constructed tabernacle with his glorious luminescence. But a problem develops for Moses, which still exists for us today. We cannot enter in to God's space. And the reason we can't enter in is because of who we are and who he is. Because God is perfection and we are sin. It's the same reason why darkness can't exist within light. Because that which is dark cannot remain next to that which is bright. So, if we are ever to dwell with God, we must become like light. Or, as the book of Leviticus will tell us, the only way to live with God closely is to be holy as he is holy. But how can we? With all our sin and everything that's broken, how will our darkness be able to enter his presence for even one moment? Well, the book of Leviticus provides us with the answer, and it's through something called atonement. Atonement is the price that has to be paid to make humans and God alike. So God graciously provided a system through priests and sacrifice to take his people's darkness and replace it with light. Atonement allowed the Israelites to transfer their darkness onto an offering God had specified. And since the cost of sin is the loss of life, that atoning offering had to die. But that only removed the penalty of darkness. It did not create any light which is why sacrifice is only part of the story atonement has to tell. The other part is that God made a way to turn his people into light as well. That's what Leviticus calls purification, the taking of the dark and making it bright with God's holy illumination. It's taking the innocence of the sacrifice and granting it to another in an act of gracious application. And that's what God gave the nation of Israel, a way for them to be light like him and live near his presence in the temple. That's why this system was essential. That's why atonement was necessary. But the problem was the effects of this ceremonial system were only temporary. For like all of us, the people who lived in the time of Leviticus did not sin just once, but constantly. So they did not need atonement one time, but repeatedly 
They could not stop becoming darkness and deserving its penalty. They could not stop becoming unlike God and needing new purity. Which is why the priests had to stand at the altar daily to make atonement for the people unceasingly. That's why Leviticus is filled with so many sacrifices and offerings. But no matter the offering, again and again, with great care and expense, the priests stood on behalf of the condemned to take their darkness, make it light, and intercede for them. So when we read in Leviticus about goat livers and dove wings, fine flour and kidneys, what we really need to see is just how much it takes to make atonement for our wrongs so we might be right. We need to see how much it costs to take our stains and make them white. We need to see that something has to die to take our darkness and make us light. But above all, we must remember the point of all of this is to make a way for us to live in God's presence. Which is why one day described in Leviticus outshines all of this meticulous maintenance. And it becomes the book's main focus. And the name for this day, the name for this moment, is the Day of Atonement. For on this day, God provided a way for just one priest, just once a year, to enter his presence, make amends for sin, and allow all God's people to be cleansed. But this priest was not truly light. He had to make his own sacrifice to briefly be allowed to enter God's might. So this was not a permanent condition, but a momentary glimpse. This was not the end of the story, but where it begins. For if humans living outside God's light are ever to be brought within, we are going to need a better priest, one who is without sin, one who doesn't have to purify himself to enter the tent, but who is already light itself and can bring us with him. Which is why what Leviticus depicts is not a finished system. Instead, it points to something else in the distance. To a day God had chosen. The day when God would complete everything Leviticus put in motion. It points us to another day, a final day of atonement. For the light in the temple, the very presence of God did not stay in heaven, but became flesh and blood. And this God in the flesh, this blood from the Father, put his own life and light on the last and final altar. The final day of atonement is in Jesus' cross. It fulfills everything Leviticus taught and every sacrifice found within. But no longer would sinners bring their offering to God, for God would be the offering for them. And so, he who is light itself took on our darkness and died for our sins. But then, Jesus did something even better than the priest did on the Day of Atonement. Jesus brought God's light out to those who before could never even approach it. Which is why Leviticus shows us that through atonement, we get to live with God. For Jesus has made us into holy light, like he is too. And the most astonishing part of this good news is that the light of God's presence actually comes to dwell in you. Hey there, hey there.
probably one of the books of the Bible that you dread reading the most. Probably the. Because you've got all this stuff and you're like, why? And why did Aaron's son have to die? And why can't we eat this? And, and why, why this and that? And all this unclean, oh, all these rules and regulations. We had one rule in the garden. Don't eat from that tree. And we still could not do it. How holy is God? I cannot even begin to fathom. All these rules and regulations are not even a drop in the bucket of what it would take to purify us to come into His presence. What only Jesus Christ could do for you. That God loves you so much that He would send His one and only Son to die for you. So that's why I wanted to hand you this handout of Leviticus 2 so we could look at it together also. This is from the Bible Project, if you wonder where it's from. And at the beginning of Leviticus, if you see in the top left corner, the Lord called to Moses from the tent, from the tabernacle that was built. And we remember back to all the, the things that were put in the temple and how the Holy Spirit gave the, the abilities to build everything and all of the rules and regulations of how the, all this had to follow. And if you look on the right-hand side, you see numbers there that the Lord spoke to Moses in the tent. He was able to come into the tabernacle. How God gives away. If you look in the top center under where it says Leviticus, here it says you have the exodus of Israel. Then we have the covenant at Mount Sinai. But the covenant is broken. Before Moses can come down from the mountain, they're like, who is this guy that brought us out in the wilderness and died? How can you forget the parting of the Red Sea and all the plagues and everything else? And especially the Passover lamb where death passed over and you had life that Moses can't enter. Stuck right below that, right in the center, is God is holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. How can we dwell with Him as a sinner such as I? So if you look at the chapters 1 to 7, which is on the top left, you see about these ritual sacrifices or offerings. You read about the grain and fellowship offerings, burnt offerings, purification offerings, so forth and so on. On the right-hand side, you see about ritual feasts that have been set up. And like they explained in the video, kind of in the middle is this Day of Atonement. All these different feasts that are set up. So now as I think about reading through the New Testament and see how Jesus came on these feast dates and how the people were gathered together, then God set that up in history where the audience would be there to see the miracles that God made. And this should be pointing, we should be teaching our children about it all up through this time that Jesus Christ is the one who does these miracles by the finger of God so that when He comes into Jerusalem, we can say, Hosanna, save us. How can we so quickly be yelling, crucify Him, crucify Him within days? Because we don't want to submit our will to live God's will. We want to be saved, but we don't want to be holy. There's a problem, guys. We're supposed to be holy, 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 just as He is holy. If you look back on the left side, verse, uh, chapters 8 to 10, we see about the, the priest being ordained. And two of his children die right off. We don't even really know why, because they burn strange fire. What does that even mean? You don't need to know what it means. It means that they tried to come to God without a way of purification. And all this is temporary, ceremonial. How in the world are we ever going to come into God's presence? How are we ever going to have the resurrecting hope that Jesus Christ came, gave to us when the women went out and found an empty tomb? Are you proclaiming that message? Look at the hope that we have. Verse, chapters 11 through 15 talk about ritual purity. What? I don't even understand those parts. I'm not supposed to eat this or that or do this or that. And it's not even anything that I did that was a sin necessarily. I just came in contact with this. But it still made you impure. You're not holy. You're not clean. You have to be cleaned. You have to be washed. Oh, that scripture that Paul wrote says you, are, you were washed. You were sanctified and made holy. And you were justified justified in the heavenly courts, found not guilty for your sins forever and ever. 
Then on the right hand side again you see the qualifications for the priest that offset the ordination. And we go into all those things that they have got to do to live a life of moral purity but yet they still sin. They can still co only come into God's presence uh, or the, the, the uh, high priest can one day out of the year. And they have to continue to bear that burden of sin and for their sin and for the people's sins. There are unacceptable sacrifices that are out there. And then we get into chapters 18 to 20 about moral purity. Well, wait a minute now. All this purity brings me into God's presence so that I can do what? Let my light so shine before men that they see my good deeds and glorify my Father in heaven. Not so that I can be saved and go about my life just as normal, living the American dream for a house, two cars, a boat, four kids, whatever it is. These are all blessings from God. And if you didn't have these blessings... You would still be blessed with eternal life if you had to wear rags and didn't have a home and place to lay your head. I believe Jesus said that. If you want to follow me, I don't have a place to lay my head. All of this is so that we can live holy, set-apart lives for God. And stuck right there in the middle, it tells us that the life is in the blood. Blood is required to cover sin. But we go through these annual festivals, these... these uh, Offerings, so much blood, so much death, so that we can be ceremonial clean and God can temporarily dwell with us. If you have a home in heaven, your names are written in the book of life because of what Jesus Christ has done for you. Leviticus 11 says, Do not defile yourselves or any of these creatures. Do not make yourselves unclean by means of them or be made unclean by them. I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves, verb, and be holy, an adjective. Be a holy people. Be a holy person. Be a holy priest because I am holy. That's why. Do not, make for your, do not make yourselves unclean by any creature that moves along the ground. I am the Lord who brought you out of Egypt to be your God. Therefore, be holy because I am holy. You don't under, have to understand why this creature or that creature. It doesn't make any difference. It matters that you are unclean. You are a sinner. You cannot come in God's presence. And besides that, you deserve His eternal wrath. But because of Jesus Christ... Jesus, 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 you can be called a child of God. Leviticus 20, verses 7 and 8, Consecrate yourselves and be holy because I am the Lord your God. Keep my decrees and follow them. I am the Lord who makes you holy. You are to be holy to me because I, the Lord, am holy, and I have set you apart from the nations to be my own to do, to be hearers and doers of the word, and it can only come because God has made you holy. He has chosen you. There are none righteous, no, not one. You're saved by grace so that you can't boast. Chapter, uh, verse 26, You are to be holy to me because I, the Lord, am holy. I have set you apart from the nations to be my own, his own possession, purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. Leviticus 11, or excuse me, Leviticus 22, verse 31 to 33. Keep my commandments and follow them. I am the Lord. Do not profane my holy name. For I must be acknowledged as holy by the Israelites. I am the Lord who made you holy and who brought you out of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord. Now we're going to keep on reading through the Old Testament. And you're going to see how stiff-necked the people of Israel are. But don't think of yourselves too highly. Consider your own stiff-neckedness. Every time you read about that, they're written, as Paul says, to be examples for us. Matthew 23, verse 23, Jesus said, Woe to you, teachers of the laws and Pharisees, the ones who knew this but <laughs> didn't have it in their heart. You hypocrites! You give a tenth of your spices, your mint, your dill, and your cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law. Action. Doers of the word. Justice mercy and faithfulness, making a difference in this world, walking by faith, fighting for the things that are of God and bringing the kingdom of God into this world. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You haven't finished Leviticus yet, so this may be a little spoiler alert, but in Leviticus 26, verse 3, If you follow my decrees and are careful to obey my commandments... 
Verse 14, but if you will not listen to me and carry out all my commandments. There's a choice here before you, just like there was in the garden. And if you choose to follow God, you have life. If you choose to follow Jesus Christ, you have eternal life that no one can ever take away from you. If you don't, though, what's the alternative? In Leviticus 27, God sums up that everything He created, everything belongs to Him. Are you His possession? Are you set apart then? So what does holy mean? It means to be set apart like Jesus Christ, submissive to God's will for His glory and honor. As a Christian, there is no other definition for a Christian. You have been washed. You have been sanctified. You have been justified. You still have the privilege of living this life to bring God glory and to tell others about Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 11, you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. So are you holy or do we need a little reviving? See, I told you I wasn't going to disagree with you. Leviticus shows us how holy God is, what must be done to just, like I said, temporarily dwell. And Hebrews shows us how to fix our eyes on Jesus. Hebrews 1, verse 1. On many past occasions and many different ways, God spoke to our fathers through the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed heir of all things, and through whom He made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory, an exact representation of His nature. So if I want to be holy and consider God's attributes and what they are, I've got to look at Jesus Christ, what He did, what He taught, and how am I going to do it except let Jesus live through me? And he said, if you love me, you will follow my commandments. You'll be known by how you love one another. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and an exact representation of His nature, upholding all things by His powerful Word. After He had provided purification for sins, He sat down at the right hand of the Majesty on high, and He has promised that He is going to prepare a place for you that you will be forever with Him. So if God is holy and we're supposed to live like Him, to be holy, and Jesus even says to be perfect, to be complete, and I look at the examples of Israel, oh, God, help me. Please, fill me with your Spirit. And I can't do that unless I am tied together with Christians. I read His Word, I pray, I spend time after time after time, at least a couple hours a day preparing a sermon to preach. Because if I didn't do that, I'm kind of like Brent. I probably would not be walking near as close to God. We're not talking about what I'd be doing as far as preaching the Word. I'm talking about my personal life. I probably would not be the light to this world that I should be. So I spend time in God's Word because I'm accountable to you. And we are each a part of the body of Christ. Each have our function. Each just as important. Some of the parts that we don't find as important, <laughs> try to live without them. John 15 verses 5 through 8 Jesus said I am the vine you are the branches the one who remains in me and I in him will bear much fruit for apart from me you can do nothing if anyone does not remain in me he is like the branch that is thrown away and withers such branches are gathered up thrown into the fire and burned if you remain in me and my words remain in you ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you this is to my father's glory that you bear much fruit proving yourself to be my disciples. So what did Jesus teach us about holy lives? Are you reading and studying His Word? You should be reading besides just this reading that you're reading, especially reading the words of Jesus. Blessed are those who... You fill in the blanks. Hebrews tells us it's a time to listen for Jesus, to listen to Jesus, to fix our eyes on the author and the perfecter of our faith, Hebrews chapter 2 says this in verse 1, We must pay 
the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard so that we do not drift away. What I was just talking about that Brent and I talked about. For since the message spoken through angels was binding and every violation of, and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? Who has number one on the verses? Would you read it for me? Number two. Four. Number six. Number seven. That's Rose. <laughs> Thank you. 
no one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the real was rejected has become the cornerstone. And a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were designed or destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Is that who we are? I had you each read it, and if you didn't notice it, it started out in Hebrews 9, verse 11. But when Christ came, and the last one I chose was 1 Peter 2, when it says, as you come to him. We could not ever be in God's presence. We would have eternal, the eternal wrath of God. Think of what Jesus did on the cross, and, and we would have to go through that forever and ever and ever. But from the beginning of time, God, knowing all of this, said, I will give up my son to save you. Will you come to him? Will you profess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord? Not just your Savior, not just your friend, not that you can just be comforted with this, but that you'll live for Him. You'll pledge your allegiance to Jesus Christ, God who came and humbled Himself but will return in His righteous glory, followed by legions of angels. Will you be there by His side? Will you hear, Well done, my good and faithful servant? You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. So set yourself apart. Don't live the way you used to. Don't let Jesus have to come to you and say, you've fallen out of love. Hebrews 3, verses 7 through 11. So as the Holy Spirit says, today if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the wilderness where your ancestors tested and tried me, though for 40 years they saw what I did. That is why I was angry with that generation. And I said, their hearts are always going astray and they have, not, they have not known my ways. So I declared an oath in my anger. They shall never enter my rest. Chapter 4, verse 6. Since there, therefore, since it still remains for some to enter that rest, and since those who formerly had the good news proclaimed to them did not go in because of their disobedience... God again set a certain day, calling it today. This he, did not, this he did when a long time later he spoke through David, as in the passage already quoted, Today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works. Got to be working first, don't we, for the kingdom? Just as God did from His, let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. Chapter 10, verse 19. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is His body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. We have been washed. Every stain washed away. You wear Jesus' robes of righteousness if, in fact, you believe in Him. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful, and let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together as some in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Maybe we need revivals more and more then. Living a holy and set apart life of faith. Is that how you live? Chapter 11, verse 6, we have this, chapter 11 is all of these Old Testament examples. So now we've got these examples that live by faith and are declared as righteous versus the many examples that we have that don't. 
And verse 6 says, And without faith, faith that is put into action, it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists, yes, and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. Chapter 12, verse 1, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders in the sin that so easily entangles. Anything and everything that keeps me from following after Jesus. So if I don't have enough time to read my Bible in the day, but I spend an hour at the gym, then something's got to go. Just saying. I had enough time, even like I said, when I was driving a car, to either put, the, put it on the radio or Sherry read it to me. And what a blessing that was for her to read it to me. Since we've got back, like I've said, I'm like, Sherry, are you caught up? Have you read yours? And I don't know what the answer is, but when she was reading it to me, I know exactly where she was at. And it pleased my soul. Let us throw off everything that hinders in the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes, not just these two, every one of these as the body, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Verse 14, make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Oh, what? live at peace with everyone. Hmm. <laughs> and be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. You have not come to Mount Sinai where the people feared that they would be literally burned up and destroyed by God's presence of how holy He is. Instead, you come into the true sanctuary in heaven, the throne room of God. As you read Revelation, think about that. All because of Jesus Christ. Who is worthy? Jesus. Are you going to be there? Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, we are receiving constant verb. It's happening now and it will happen for all eternity because once you were washed and sanctified and justified, it began. Therefore, since we're receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful in all that we do. And so worship God acceptably offering my body up as a living sacrifice with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers for by doing so some people have shown hospitality to angels without even knowing it. Continue to remember those in prison as if they were if as if you were together with them in prison, and those who are mistreated as if you are, yourselves are suffering. Marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and the sexually immoral. Keep your lives free from the love of money, and be content with what you have. Because God has said, Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Then why do I need to work so hard? Why do I need to worry about the things? And that is what... The American dream is about these days. It's not what it was founded on. It was founded on that we could worship God without persecution. But now it's about that I can have this or have that and I can give this to my children and not to my children. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Hebrews kind of closes up this brief exhortation, he says, because you can read it pretty fast if you want to go read it again. Now may the God of peace who through the blood of the eternal covenant, do you get it? Brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with every good for doing His will. And may He work in us what is pleasing to Him through Jesus Christ, to Him be glory forever and ever. I have to think about a verse like that each and every day or I get sidetracked. That it's not about me, not about what I've got to get done, not about anything else, not about the, the pain I have in my joints or, or the things I'm facing 
you know, in uh, my children or anything else. It's about bringing glory and honor to God. And He has equipped me and will equip me. And if I need to be revived to understand that, then so be it. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 55 to 58. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Praise be to God and for Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit who seals us and sanctifies us through and through as we allow Him to do it. You know, if you've ever had the, um, which I don't guess I have, but you know what a house is like when it's new. Yeah, it's got that new smell. Everything works. Everything else. But don't you have to maintain it? Sometimes you have to do spring cleaning. I went and bought some Clorox wipe and a dust mop from ProX. She said, are we doing spring cleaning? I'm like, no, I just needed a mop and some wipes. But sure. Because spring cleaning implies that we're going to get down and really do these things and get in every nook and cranny and see what's dirty. Are you willing to do that? Or are you going to have to wait till Jesus says, I have this against you. You have fallen out of love with me. You don't love me like you first did. I don't feel like I am your precious possession. You love others. Whatever, however you take that. Holiness. Does it matter to you? How are you doing? Do you know Jesus Christ? And are you living for Him as your Lord and Savior? Have you stripped away the things that entangle you? Are you fully living for Jesus and for the day of His return? 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, and I'm going to go to 2, 6. This is the message we have heard from Him and declared to you. God is light. In Him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with Him and yet walk in the darkness... We lie, and we do not live out the truth, no matter what we say. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. That's what He puts first. And the blood of Jesus, His Son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, if we look for that dirt and ask Him to clean it up for us, because we can't clean it up on our own, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we have claimed we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. Totally, 100% sanctified, never sinning again. But if anybody does sin, me. <clears throat> I have an advocate. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Oh, praise be to God for Jesus, for what he has done, for what he will do, for what he will forever do. My King, my Savior, my Lord, my friend, Master, Shepherd, Rock of all ages. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sin, and not only for our sins, but also for the sins of the whole world. We know that we have come to know Him if we keep His commands. Whoever says, I know Him, but does not do what He commands is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys His word, love for God is truly made complete in them. They're perfect as their heavenly Father is perfect, wholly set apart to do His will, and will forever come into His presence. This is how we know we are in Him, Whoever claims to live in Him must live as Jesus did. Holiness unto the Lord. Set apart, living differently, not living for the desires you used to have, but for living for the kingdom, living for others, living for His glory and His honor and for His praise. Today you're going to read Revelation chapter 3. Read it. If you haven't followed along, read it today. 
because you're going to get down to that lukewarm church who says they're okay, who doesn't live a bad life. They say they're not like those debauchery people and all those idolatrous sins. Okay, sure we're not. And Jesus says, Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to them and eat with that person and they with me. Wow, the faithfulness of Jesus drawing you to him. Will you give him the praise and glory and honor that he deserves? If there's any cleaning, will you let him clean you? Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you. Oh, that Jesus would come and lay down his life for us. That he would stand silently as people mocked and jeered him and beat him and as Isaiah said, made him to not even have the appearance of a man anymore. He was so badly beaten. But instead, he did not say a word. When he was mocked and said, come down off of that cross and save yourself, huh, I know my sinful desires and forgive me for them. I would have wanted to come off and show them just how much of a God I was. But that's not your way. Your way is to show us humility, to show us grace, to show us love, to show us mercy, to develop in our hearts a desire to love others more than ourselves, to be willing to lay down our lives for a friend, to love even our enemies, to not keep records of wrongs, but to love as Jesus Christ loves. Father, we thank you and praise you. We thank you for an empty tomb so that we know that we have hope our sins have been paid for, but that doesn't end it. We know that we have hope for eternal life, and He has given us the Spirit now so that we may truly live for Him, not for ourselves, but for Him, building up treasures in heaven rather than trying to build up treasures here on earth that will be burned away. Father, forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Search our hearts, O Lord. We thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen.